Hello and welcome to the April edition of the IMV Imaging Journal Club. I'm Harriet, one of the members of the clinical team here at IMV, and this month I've decided to look into the comparison of the clinical ultrasound and CT findings in 13 dogs with gastric neoplasia. I've chosen this paper as gastric neoplasia can be notoriously difficult to diagnose in general practice, especially in the early stages. So as I was saying, this paper was published in the Veterinary Radiology and Ultrasound in September, October 2021, and was conducted by the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Gastric neoplasia accounts for less than 1% of all neoplasms diagnosed in dogs, with the most common gastric neoplasia being adenocarcinoma. There are other tumours including lymphoma, leomyosarcoma, leomyoma, extramedullary plasmacytoma, fibrosarcoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumours, mast cell tumours and polyps are also reported. Diagnosis is often difficult and commonly occurs late in the disease process. Abdominal ultrasound and endoscopy are commonly the imaging modalities of choice when identifying and diagnosing canine gastric tumours. It must be remembered that confirmed diagnosis should only be made following histopathology or cytology of biopsy samples. The difficult presentation of these cases can include a range of gastrointestinal signs, such as anorexia, vomiting, lethargy, melina, weight loss, abdominal distension and diarrhoea, making it difficult to differentiate from other pathologies affecting the gastrointestinal tract. The objectives of this study are 1. Determine whether CT without iatrogenic gastric distension aids in the identification, characterisation and diagnosis of gastric tumours and two, whether CT aids in the selection of surgical candidates. This was a retrospective descriptive study, whereby a search was performed from the Medical Records and Radiology Information System of the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Purposeful sampling was used to collect cases of dogs with confirmed cytological or histological diagnosis of a gastric tumour between January 1st, 2010 and July 1st, 2019. The inclusion criteria for this study required dogs to have received both an abdominal CT and an abdominal ultrasound at the institution within a seven day period. The decision to include patients was made on the consensus opinions of a board certified veterinary radio oncologist and a board certified veterinary radiologist. The order of the ultrasound and CT was also recorded and if available, endoscopy, surgery and necropsy reports were collected, reviewed and compared to the ultrasound and CT reports regarding the tumour location and the selection of surgical candidates. The analysis of this data was primarily descriptive using Cohen Kappa, which is a metric often used to assess the agreement between two raters, which for this study was a veterinary student and a veterinary epidemiologist. The data was first evaluated for normal distribution and then evaluated using basic mean and standard deviation. The agreement between two, ra two raters was described as complete if all described locations of the tumour by CT or ultrasound were consistent with the surgical, endoscopic or necropsy report, partial if the CT or ultrasound identified at least one consistent location with direct visualisation, or none if there was no agreement between either the CT, ultrasound and the direct visualisation. For statistical analysis, complete and partial agreement were considered a positive agreement between either CT or ultrasound and then direct visualisation. Percent agreement and Cohen's kappa were calculated to evaluate the agreement between CT and ultrasound in tumour identification, tumour location and detection of abnormal lymph nodes. Statistical significance was set at p's less than 0.05. The results from this study were as followed. There was a total of 13 dogs included in the study, seven of which were male, six were female. The mean age at the time of diagnosis was 10.9 years. The breeds of the dog included in the study were a mix, including three crossbreeds, two Jack Russell Terriers, one miniature Schnauzer, one Cavalier King Charles, one English Spring Spaniel, one Maltese, one Chihuahua, one Bull Mastiff, one Chow and a Scottish Terrier. The gastric tumours identified include leomyomas, adenocarcinoma, leomyosarcoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumours and lymphoma. Tumour diagnoses were performed by surgical excision or biopsy, endoscopic biopsy or necropsy. The most common clinical signs in order of most frequent to least were anorexia, vomiting, melina, weight loss, 
abdominal distension and diarrhea. Prior to discussing the diagnostic imaging used in this study, it's important to note that the, vet, that the radiologist examining the images was aware that the study involved the diagnosis of gastric tumours, but not the tumour type or characteristics. The images were evaluated to determine the tumour location, shape, margination and the size of the gastric tumour. The presence of additional gastric masses, intratumoral mineralisation, intratumoral fluid filled areas, lymph node enlargement, free peritoneal fluid and suspected metastases. All suspected metastases were compared to cytology and histopathology reports when available. All ultrasound examinations were performed using a 5 to 8 megahertz microconvex transducer or where applicable a 5 to 17 and a half megahertz linear transducer. One of two different ultrasound machines were used to carry out the examination. All the ultrasounds were performed by a board certified veterinary radiologist or a resident under direct supervision. The dogs were sedated, clipped and positioned in dorsal recumbency for the examinations. So before moving on to the findings, it's important to note the limitations when performing an ultrasound of the stomach. Due to the position within the abdominal cavity, it's difficult to evaluate every region of the stomach, particularly the cardia, or when trying to identify smaller sized or more subtle lesions. This limitation is further exacerbated due to artifacts created by gas or gastric contents, the body conformation of the patient, notably deep chested dogs, where it's more difficult to thoroughly assess the cranial abdominal structures and an intercostal approach may be necessary. Uh, from review, reviewing the saved abdominal ultrasound images and cine loops, it was found that the ultrasound identified nine of the 13 gastric tumours, with four of the nine lesions presenting as a gastric wall thickening rather than a distinct mass. Of the four tumours that were not identified, three were leomyomas and one was an adenocarcinoma. From the findings, lymphoma was the only case to present as a partial loss of gastric wall layering, whilst the other gastric tumours all had complete loss of gastric wall layering. In one case of leomyosarcoma, the gastric mass extended extramurally involving both the pancreas and the transverse colon. One case of leomyoma uh, presented with both intratumoral mineralisation and fluid filled areas, Another case of leomyosarcoma also presented with intratumoral fluid filled areas and abnormal lymph nodes were identified in 8 out of the 13 patients on ultrasound examination. Moving on to the CT examination of these patients, all CT scans were performed using 8 slice or 16 slice multi-detect row helical CT unit with all dogs under GA and positioned in either sternal or dorsal recumbency. Iatrogenic gastric distension was not performed as standard protocol in this study. However, it was noted that two patients already had marked gastric distension on image interpretation. All dogs received two mils per kilo iohexol injected IV using either manual injection or a power injector. When a power injector was used, the flow rate was set at two mils per second with a pressure limit of 325 psi. Triple contrast angiography studies, including arterial portal and delayed venous phases, were captured for some cases. For single post contrast studies, images were required approximately 30 to 40 seconds after intravenous contrast administration. There was some variability in timings over the study period. Once acquired, images were reconstructed into transverse, sagittal, and dorsal planes using soft tissue and bone algorithms. On examination of the images, CT identified 12 of the 13 gastric tumours. Triple contrast angiography studies, including arterial, portal and delayed venous phases, were captured for nine of the 13 total cases. One gastric tumour was not identified on first interpretation, but was identified on second review during this study by the radiologist who was aware of the final diagnosis. The gastric tumour presented as a diffuse wall thickening and was confirmed to be an adenocarcinoma after surgical excision. Lymphoma was the only case considered multifocal, with two lesion locations identified in the stomach on CT, one in the pyloric antrum and one within the body, with both lesions being described as a focal wall thickening. In the case of lymphoma, both the pancreas and hepatic lymph nodes appeared to be also be involved. In one case of leomyosarcoma, the gastric mass extended extramurally. Intratumoral fluid-filled areas were described in one case of gastrointestinal stroma tumour, leomyosarcoma and leomyoma. Intertubular mineralization was described in one case of leomyosarcoma and abnormal lymph nodes were identified in eight of the 13 patients on CT images. This slide shows the pre-contrast, so the upper row, 
and the delays phase post contrast the lower row CT transverse images, illustrating a case of each tumour type. In all cases, the mean attenuation values increased for the tumour types following administration of contrast agent. However, lymphoma had the lowest pre and post contrast mean attenuation values than any other gastric tumour. Starting from left to right, the gastric tumour can be identified by the white arrow surrounded by a red circle to highlight it. Image A is an adenocarcinoma along the lesser curvature of the stomach. Image B is a leomyoma within the body of the stomach. Image C is a leomyosarcoma within the pyloric antrum. Image D is a gastrointestinal stromal tumour within the pylorus. And image E is the case of lymphoma within the pyloric antrum. So looking at endoscopy, surgery and necropsy findings, all cases underwent direct visualisation of the gastric neoplasia. Two dogs had endoscopy performed with conclusive biopsies in one patient for adenocarcinoma, whereas the other patient had an abbreviated endoscopy before directly going to surgery. This patient had previously had endoscopic biopsies performed on a gastric mass that proved inconclusive. 10 of the 13 dogs underwent surgery with either biopsies of the mass taken or complete excision. Four dogs were diagnosed with leomyoma, with one case being complete agreement with the CT findings and three cases being only in partial agreement. The location was in partial agreement in one case on ultrasound, with the remaining cases not identified on ultrasound examination. Three cases of leomyosarcoma sarcoma underwent surgery. One case had complete agreement on ultrasound and the surgical report. Of the other two cases, CT and ultrasound were consistent with each other in their findings but were either in partial or no agreement with the surgical report. One of the two gastrointestinal stromal tumours underwent surgery. Um, despite being partial agreement between the CT um, and ultrasound examinations on location of the mass, this was not in agreement with the surgical report. In the case of the adenocarcinoma, there was agreement between both the CT, ultrasound and the surgery report. There was one case that underwent necropsy and the patient was diagnosed at the time of a gastrointestinal stromal tumour and was described in the necropsy report as being a large focal thickening in the greater curvature of the stomach. However, this location was not in agreement with either the ultrasound or the CT interpretation. On review, ultrasound identified 69% of the gastric tumours, while CT identified 92% with a low percentage agreement on, of 61.5% and a Cohen's kappa of less than zero. Only five cases of the total 13 had complete agreement on tumour location between CT, ultrasound and direct visualisation via surgery, endoscopy or necropsy. However, CT appeared to have partial or complete agreement with direct visualisation in nine of the 13 cases, whilst ultrasound was in partial or complete agreement with only five. In one case of adenocarcinoma, neither CT or ultrasound could accurately identify the location of the gastric lesion when compared with the endoscopy report. In the case of lymphoma, the lesion locations were not in complete agreement with ultrasound or CT. However, CT was more accurate when compared to the surgery report in identifying the location and extramural extension. There was a fair agreement in detection of abnormal lymph nodes on CT and ultrasound, although CT identified a greater number overall. However, the majority of lymph nodes noted as abnormal were not found to be metastatic on cytology. Moving on to the limitations. There was only a small sample size included, and with that, a small number of each type of gastric tumour. Therefore, no correlations could be extrapolated from the data between the features of each gastric tumour type. Therefore, this sample size is not representative of the entire dog patient population with gastric neoplasia or all types of gastric neoplasia for that matter, as only five types were included. Furthermore, patients had to have received both an abdominal ultrasound and CT within seven days over the nine years of this study. It would seem reasonable to assume that this hospital has seen more than 13 cases of gastric neoplasia and with that assume that these cases are often identified on ultrasound and it is more likely that patients with an inconclusive ultrasound are then referred to CT, providing a source of possible sample bias towards CT. Ultrasound and CT are not routinely performed at this institute for patients presenting with progressive vomiting, anorexia and weight loss, therefore providing no control sample for the study. Uh, just a few, a few more limitations to highlight. Uh, the interpretation of the images was biased as the board certified radiologist was aware of the final diagnosis prior to examining the images. The radiologist was also reviewing previously recorded ultrasound images, so therefore the evaluation 
of the stomach was dependent on the completeness of the original examination. Further to that, there was no standardisation in the collection of ultrasound images as they were obtained by both radiologists and residents. And with that, the quality of the recorded images may vary from case to case. The final point is in regard to the statistical analysis, which depended on the agreement between a veterinary student and epidemiologists for the statistical relevance, which could introduce possible bias. And finally, the discussion and the clinical relevance to general practice. Thinking back to the original study objectives, one, determine whether CT without iatrogenic gastric distension aids in the identification, the characterization and the diagnosis of gastric tumours. From this study, it can be concluded that CT should be recommended as an ancillary diagnostic imaging modality for detection, treatment planning and staging of dogs with suspected gastric neoplasia, especially in cases where the findings are inclusive of an ultrasound examination. And two, were the CT aids in the selection of surgical candidates? As we know, gastric neoplasia is difficult to diagnose and commonly is identified late in the disease process, where metastases are present and surgery becomes a less viable option. CT could possibly be used in the identification of small lesions in the early disease stages. In conclusion, the definitive diagnosis of these tumours can only be achieved following cytology or histological evaluation. And in regard to general practice, ultrasound and endoscopy still continue to be the first line imaging modalities in the investigation of gastric neoplasia. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this month's article and we look forward to seeing you back next month for another edition of the IMV Imaging Journal Club. For any questions regarding the paper, please send them to clinical at imv-imaging.com. Goodbye.